Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome good morning. to worship today. I was sharing with the people out there. I got together with my tech study pastor this past week. And, uh, we're sharing how excited we were. We had Easter and how many people were here. And then we were lamenting because this is what's commonly known across the nominations as Low Sunday. Because we have all these people come on Christmas or Easter and we're all excited. Look at this, 160 people. And the next thing we got are normal people. <laughs> <laughs> so we celebrate the time, we celebrate uh, Easter and all those people coming and God knows that we want them here. But thank you for our faithful who are here all the time. It's a great joy. I celebrate this. And then I look outside and it on that last year, uh, Dick got a quote from them, and they did really great work. Fifty-five hundred dollars. They're going to do the whole thing. Wow! Oh my oh. God. Oh. Oh, nice. Nice. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and start next week. Is that it? Um, yeah, Dick is signing the contract next week. They're going to do it sometime as they have time this summer. They expect us to pay by fall. Thanks for the rivers and the streams. Honor to you for waters and wash us clean. Quench our thirst and nurture both crops and creatures. Praise to you for the life giving waters of baptism, the outpouring of the Spirit of the new creation. Wash away our sin and all the separates us from you. Empower our witness to your resurrection. Strengthen our resolve and seek. Yourselves know. 
This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is taken from Psalm 16 and is sung responsibly as printed in the bulletin. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all others. Although you have not seen him, you love him. 
And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Carry 20 for dinner as a thank you. 
So they sit down and they have this <coughs> wonderful dinner. They laugh and talk and they <coughs> share some of their deepest hopes and dreams. It was one of those improbable, perfect moments which cannot be plain, planned or scripted. You know, he said jokingly, are you this nice to every guy you meet? <coughs> and she went, no, you just happened to catch my eye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm sure this woman didn't want her idol to fly out of her head across the room, but I'm quite certain that this man didn't think that by scooping up her eye, his life might just change. Who could imagine that encounter? So I want to share with you a couple of things that kind of caught my eye in our gospel reading today. Some things that were life changing. First, I think we know that Thomas gets a bad rap for being blamed as the one who doubted. I want to be clear. Doubting is not wrong. Doubting is not the opposite of faith. In fact, Doubt is the essential part of faith. Without doubt, we have certainty. And with certainty, we have no faith. And faith is at the heart of what our gospel is today. And Thomas, he didn't doubt any more than the rest of the disciples. Those guys had gathered in the house, and they locked the doors out of fear. They didn't trust Jesus when he said he'd return after three days. And they didn't trust, they doubted the women's report as they came and told them about the empty tomb and that Jesus was going to come right in that room and meet them there. Instead, they cowered in fear, afraid of their own religious leaders who had tortured and killed people, <coughs> and probably waiting for them to do the same. And perhaps that's why Thomas wasn't there. Maybe he didn't want to be around those people who feared. <coughs> I wanted to be alone to get his mind kind of wrapped around what had happened. Or the disciples track him down and they tell them and tell Thomas of this improbable, if not unbelievable, tale that Jesus, his friend, who he watched die a horrific death, is now alive. But was he really supposed to believe this? Believe that Jesus just appeared out of thin air in a locked room? Or they gave him a peace that surpassed all understanding? They showed him his wounds and he breathed on them the Holy Spirit? And they can now forgive sin? Wait a minute. I thought only God could forgive sin. So I really don't think he doubted Jesus as much as he doubted this hard to believe story told by the disciples. I can imagine Thomas saying something like, come on guys, really? I'm going to need some proof here before I believe what you're laying down. I want to see those scars. I want some hard evidence before I believe any of this nonsense you're telling me. Well, proof is what Thomas gives. Jesus returns a week later to that same room, that same room that was locked, and he appears. But this time, Thomas is there, right? And Jesus offers them all peace. And this isn't just like, hi guys, I hope you're having a good day kind of peace. This is shalom peace. This is the peace that settles into you deeply and guides your heart and your mind and soul. Peace. And he says, come here, Thomas. Come on, touch my hand. Touch my side. Feel my wounds. I am here. I am who I say I am. And I love this part. I picture Thomas looking at his Jesus with a Kind of a tear, maybe, completely overwhelmed. And, when, and he says, my Lord, my God. It's one of the few places in Scripture where there's no ambiguity, there's no question. It's stated, Jesus is God. 
So here's another thing that caught my eye. I wondered why Jesus, the Son of God, who was raised from the dead, had scars on him at all. I mean, to me, it would make more sense that Jesus would rise out of that tomb unscathed. He'd be healed. He healed everybody else. And maybe the apostles should be saying something like, Jesus, this is amazing. You're not only risen, but you're completely healed. There's no evidence that you were crucified at all. Why, it's like Good Friday never happened. But you see, Good Friday must happen. When Jesus comes to us with the scars of pain and betrayal, he is united with us in our wounds that come to each of us in our mind, our body, or our soul. None of us gets through this world unscathed. Reverend William Joseph Adams said this in a commentary I read this week. This is what makes this encounter so remarkable. Even in his resurrection, Jesus is united in our humanity. Those wounds represent God's love and compassion for each one of us. Those wounds stands for God's connection and compassion for every single one of us. Those wounds are God's intense thirst for justice and forgiveness, acceptance and mercy, because those wounds are also our wounds. Good stuff. And then Jesus, he looks at Thomas with love and compassion, saying, you know, you believed in me because you saw me. But man, blessed are those who have not seen me and they believe one like Thomas and the rest of the disciples, we don't get that hard, empirical, scientific proof of Jesus' existence. We cannot physically touch Jesus' hands and feel his side or even grasp him. We can't even hear his voice. But we are given something that is more meaningful, I think, than proof. We have something that moves mountains, moves hates towards love, revenge towards forgiveness, inspires love in a way that's countercultural, selfless, and unconditional. By the Holy Spirit, we are given faith. We are given faith to believe that Jesus did, in fact, live. He did teach us to love and seek justice for his creation. He did die, but he also rose. And he does forgive our sin. He is, in fact, the Savior of the world. So the goal of faith, it isn't to eliminate doubt. In fact, I think doubt gives birth to questions. And it's by questioning that we can gain a deeper understanding of who God is in our lives. This is why we gather for Bible study. This is why we sit out there in the foyer and we talk amongst ourselves. This is why we search, because there's holiness in the search and the questions. You know, to prove something is an end. It's done. Two plus two is four. Faith, on the other hand, is an ongoing journey. There's humility in faith. There is saying, I'm not 100% certain. Because when I've been 100% certain in my life, I've usually, if not always, been 100% wrong. Doubt gives us a chance to relook at what we believe. And this, I think, that we get to rejoice, that we have a God who comes to us wounded, just as we are wounded, who does not fear our doubt, but embraces them, helps transform them into faith in Christ. God comes to us just as we are. And this, my friends, is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to God in heaven. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue with our hymn of the day. The peace of the Lord, number 646, under him.
to a weary world. Following the women at the tomb, empower us to boldly share your radical love through our words and our work. Hear us, O God. As you breathe your spirit into the disciples, breathe your spirit of healing upon all creation. Nourish the earth with sufficient rains. Strengthen us to counter the effects of pollution and destruction. Merciful God, you prepared the disciples for their ministry by calming their fears and granting them your peace. Equip our community's leaders and give them a spirit of peace and hearts that burn for justice, that their leadership reflects your love. Merciful God, you come among us in unexpected ways. Send us to those who hide in fear or question your love. Be a healing presence for any isolated by addiction, incarceration, mental illness, chronic pain, sickness, or grief, especially those who we name aloud or in our hearts at this time. Merciful God, as you met the disciples on the road to Emmaus, show us your presence along our journeys. Bless our doubts and questions provide trusting and safe relationships for all ages, to nurture our connection to you and one another. Merciful God, resurrecting God, you bring us to new life every day. Thank you for blessing us with companions on our faith journey, especially those who now rest in your love. Strengthen us with the eternal peace of your promise. Merciful God, Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, 
we lift our prayers and praise you, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And with you. Please take time to share that peace with you. With a grateful heart and inspired by the gospel of Jesus Christ, we share our gifts of money to serve our church, our community, and all of those in need. Mm.
And again after supper, he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The table is set. All is ready. All are welcome, just as you are, to receive God's grace and love and forgiveness. Please. Be
Christ. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in it. Through this meal, you have put gladness in our hearts, satisfied the hunger still around us. Send us as joyful witnesses that you love, that your love may bring joy to the hearts of all people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And may our glorious God grant you the spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the God of life, Father. Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Our sending him that all things now live in. Number 881.